Often interests me how many of the little words we use every day in life, we never really think about what they mean. Take a word like beauty, for example. What is beauty? Well, the other day I was uh, driving from where I live in Dundee in Scotland up to Inverness in the Highlands, and as we drove along the highway, there by the side of the road was a little sign that said viewpoint this way. So I do what I often do in these situations. I'm a sucker for this stuff. I pulled off the road, half a mile off the highway, this Scottish lock, this lake, beautiful mountains behind. And I, of course, did what all of us would do. I whipped out my iPhone, took a few photos, posted them on, on Facebook. Where would we be without a social media audience to share things with? Now, here's the thing. Why do landscapes like that draw us? Why is it that people climb to the top of mountains and you know sweat blood and tears to get up there to see the view? Why is it we put signs on highways? Why do people get into photography and, and try and capture this stuff? What is it about beauty that attracts and draws us in that makes us go, wow, and you know, I want to share that with my friends? Now, of course, at this point, one of the phrases that people will often land upon is, well, you know, beauty is, it's entirely subjective. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The problem with sound bites like that is though they're usually wrong. If beauty is purely my response to something, then when I tell you that I find that mountain view or that photograph or that piece of art beautiful, I'm not telling you about it, I'm just telling you about what's going on in my head. And beauty and art have collapsed to psychology. And uh, many writers and thinkers who've thought long and hard about these things will say the more you wrestle with it, the more you come to the conclusion that when we say something is beautiful, we really are grappling with something real, that beauty is, is bigger than just our own perception. So what is it? Well, quite frankly, two choices open up before us now. If we live in a world that is purely materialistic, if our atheist friends are right, and there is no God, everything is just atoms banging together, it's very, very hard to explain things like beauty. In fact, one of my sceptical friends once said to me, he said, well, you know, we can explain everything as atheists using evolution. And he said, you know, your response to a beautiful landscape is, is just a sort of echo of the idea that our ancient ancestors would have seen those landscapes as good places to hunt game. And today that manifests itself as you taking a photo on your iPhone. I remember looking at him quizzically and saying, I've just got back from trekking in the Himalayas. I went to Everest Base Camp. Can you explain to me how the massive glaciers and rock faces of Everest are a place to hunt game? That conversation sort of ended there. Somebody once remarked, you know, if you are an atheist, it's best to have in your mind the little word only. You know, the sunset is only light rays bouncing off the clouds. Uh, that beautiful view of the mountains, oh, that's only chemicals firing in your brain and making you feel that's an awesome view and so forth. That's a fairly shallow view of reality. What about if something else is going on? What about if the story that the Christian faith tells is true? There is a creator, there is an artist, there is a designer who put all of this together. And the reason that we're drawn to beauty is we recognize the work of the maker. You know, it's interesting that when Christians and skeptics talk, often the debate comes down to, you know, what is true, Christianity or atheism? And that's not unimportant. I mean, ultimately, there's only one good reason to believe anything, if it's true. But what if the Christian faith is bigger than that? What if the God who put all of this world together and created you and I is not just the God who is the source of all truth, but also the God of all beauty? And what we see, just glimpsed for a moment in a beautiful piece of art, or our natural landscape like the one I saw in Scotland is a sign and a doorway into something much, much bigger. I described earlier how on the side of the highway I saw that sign pointing me to the viewpoint. What if the viewpoint itself is a signpost, a sign of transcendence pointing to the God who is the artist who is responsible for this all? Next time you see a beautiful view, a beautiful landscape, beautiful piece of art, perhaps ask yourself the question, where is it pointing? And am I willing not just to know about the art, but also to look into meeting the artist.